Please welcome Bishop John Felici. Thank you. I'm honored and delighted to be here. I was on the campus here, as was said, of the seminary for, I think it was 16 years. And then I got a letter one day that you have been um, traded to another to a parish for two draft choices and, and a priest to be named later, so. Um, but I'm back, so good to be here. I'll just share with you some of the experiences I've had over time that I have found helpful for me to reflect upon. One of them is in a time of difficulty and crisis, I think it's, it's, it's tempting for us to become so problem-centered that we forget about the positives. Um, I remember one time I was asked to substitute in a high school class of girls at a school nearby because the priest had, who taught the class called up and was sick. And so they called me out of the blue and asked me if I could just take this one 45-minute class. So in fear and trembling, I went up and met these, this junior class who clearly saw that I was going to be a victim <laughs> of, their, of their awareness that I didn't quite know what I was doing. So I said, OK, um, how about we, we just have a discussion for 45 minutes? Oh, they love that. That was great. So I said, well, I, OK, I made the first step right. Now I've got to figure out. What is on your mind, I asked them. And they all told me a similar story, that they had just received their report cards. And uh, I said, well, how did that go? And they were, oh, no, they were all shaking their heads. And I said, well, well what's the matter? And they said, it's our parents. They all agreed, looking at each other, it's their parents. The parents were too critical of them. They're always critical. No matter what my grades are, they're always critical. So I said, well, I'll, let's play a little game. Well, as soon as I said the word game, they said, wow, that was, this was good news. They're going to like this guy. I thought they were going to ask me to come back after that as soon as I used the word game. So I asked them to um, close their eyes and they closed their eyes. And I turned around, and there was on the blackboard behind me, I wrote, I wrote four letters that they couldn't see. A, 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 and C. And I said, OK, open your eyes. So they opened their eyes, and I said, OK, what I did was I have behind me my report card. When I step aside, I want you to shout out whatever comes into your mind. I stepped aside. And they all yelled out, why did you get the C? I said, I hate you. You're just like your parents. I got a Valentine's Day card for one of the girls in the class. This is 48 years later. And she said, I'm, I'm still recovering from that, from that class. Um, but it's, it's I, I said to them, if only you had told me how proud you were of my getting the three A's, I would have changed the C to the A on my own uh, just to make you prouder. But that's not what you did. You pointed out what was wrong with me. And this is what can so easily become a way of life for us, to focus on the things we see as wrong or bad. And if we do that to others, we're probably doing it to ourselves. To ourselves. Um, I remember uh, a priest coming to see me who was ordained a year and he 
he asked me to meet with him and I could see he was very disturbed. And he said basically, since my ordination, everything's gone wrong. And so he, I listened to him and we, we met in a diner and I listened to him and listened to the whole story. And I said, look, I have no magic solution, but let's try an experiment. I said, I want you to go home and focus on one thing that you see as a positive. So he said the only thing that had gone well for him had been his preaching because it was un un uninterrupted by everybody else criticizing him for one thing or another. So I said, okay, I want you to go back and in the course of a day, I want you to list down five, at least five things, positive things that you see or happen in the course of a day. And so we met two weeks later and he came in and I could see he was looked a little better than the last time. Sat down and he said, well, here's my list. I've been working very hard at this. And he started to the, the list of things. And I already saw that he was becoming aware of positives in his life that he had been taking for granted. So I said, let's try this one more time and see what happens. And he came back. We met two weeks later. He sat down and he said, I'm living a completely different life than I lived before. He said, it's my whole priesthood had transformed. And he said, just in this, this one experiment, he said, because I realized I've spent so many times, anything, something goes wrong, I focus on it and focus on it, and that creates problems with everything else. And now I've shifted gears completely. I said, well, if you can stay on that course, I'm sure all good would come of it. That was over 30 years ago, and he's a pretty renowned priest whose name I will not mention. But, um, and every now and then, when I've seen him over the years, uh, he's winked at me and we've laughed. Uh, and he said, what did you have? What did you have at the diner last time you were there? Um, so f being able to focus on the positive, you can't take that for granted. Um, I think one time I was asking another, this was a, a boys class, they asked me, uh, uh, what, are, what, what would he, are we going to be asked at the judgment seat of God? And I said, well, if it's only one question, it might be this one. What did you do with your capacity to care? What did you do with your capacity to care? Because that's what we remember about Jesus, his capacity to care for us. His capacity to care for us. What about our capacity to care for others? Do we take advantage of opportunities that present themselves? I read an interesting description of uh, practical meaning of love and it said when you're concerned about the, the satisfaction, security, and a development of another person as much as you are about your own, a state of love probably exists between you. When you care about their satisfaction, their development, and their security as much as you do your own. Yes, to be able to focus on the positives is absolutely critical. We cannot take anything for granted. There's the story of the town council that was given a lot of money. They inherited a lot of money. And they all met and decided that they were going to put up a clock in their town, devote all this money to a clock and it was going to be a magnificent clock that would make the town renowned. And one, the oldest member of the group said, you know, I'm not sure we have enough fire equipment. Are you, should we really be devoting ourselves to this clock? And they all shut them down. And the clock went up and it was a huge hit and everybody was so proud of themselves. Until one day when there was this fire in the town and things hadn't gone so well in the fire. And the town council met again, silence in the room. And the older member raises his hand and he says, well, at least we know what time the fire started. <laughs> so <laughs> being able to, to point out the positive, what the positives are. Um, you know, another thing I've learned is uh, I, I was asked to preach at the first Mass 
of a priest who was a year behind me in the seminary. And I, I remember feeling very ill at ease because I said, wow, I'm only ordained a year. What am I going to say at this mass? So I, I, I looked over the gospel and read it and reread it. And it was uh, the line, there were four words in there that came out of the gospel that day. And it says, one sows, another reaps. And I began to look at that and I said, why does this ring a bell with me? Why does this ring a bell with me? And I realized that I was in my first year as a priest, I was trying to always prove that I could be an effective priest. In other words, I was focusing on what did I reap today? What did I reap today? What did I reap today? And it says one sows and other reaps. And so I remember thinking that, and this is 50 years ago, I remember thinking, um, I've just got to focus on the sowing and, and let the reaping up to, and I immediately felt a sense of relief, relief. And you know, in our culture, we've grown increasingly product oriented, measuring success on computers and analysis and diagrams of all times, which most of you may have to do for your work. I understand that completely, assessment outcomes. But in the work of the ministry of, of, of God, in the work of the ministry of Jesus, um, it's better to just emphasize the sowing and leave the results up to God. I remember um, and that had a big, made a big impression on me. And um, I thank the priest to this day for that. Well, he's long retired, but I thanked him. One of us had to retire. He decided to be him. Um, but I thanked him to this day for the opportunity. And he said, even I don't remember what the gospel was at my first mass. How could you possibly remember that? So, uh, but I, I, another thing, when I was in the parish, uh, I was teaching in the eighth grade, I think, and I decided I wanted to form a discussion group. And uh, I was really, I, this, this was going to be really good. So I got this group together with the permission of the principal, and we met four times. And basically, it was one form of a disaster after another. Um, I, had no, I had no control over the group. They were yelling and carrying on, talking to each other, uh, singing songs that had just come out from the Beatles. <laughs> and I said, this isn't working. I'm not convincing them that we need to focus on Jesus and their prayer life. So I went to the principal and she said, how's it going? And I said, I'm not so sure. And she says, she smiled and said, yeah, that's the impression I have. So we decided that I would declare a victory and retire this program at the end of four weeks. And so it struck me, well, I learned from the experience. You know, I learned from the experience. But I didn't really learn from that experience until time went on. There were eight members of that discussion group. Four of them are in contact with me today. Recently, I went out to dinner with two of them and their spouses. I not only presided at the wedding of one of the of the now men there, who was one of those eighth grade boys carrying on at great extent and causing all kinds of trouble. But uh, I presided at his wedding and his daughter's wedding. And really recently we went out to dinner with him and his brother, who was another troublemaker in the group. And uh, they said they're still trying to repay me for the damage they did. Uh, and I still get cards sometimes and notes from, from other kids in that group of eight. And there were 12 other classes after that. I don't get notes from any of them. And I said, wow, this is amazing to me. Over time, it's completely unfolded. And a couple of times there were emergencies. One, one of the girls in that, in that group was in a severe car accident and lost her. She lost, had two children, she lost one and she almost lost her own life. And the, her sister left a message on my machine telling me about it. So I drove up to uh, Maine, to the hospital. And um, I was there for her, and for her husband, and for the funeral. And I realized that what happened that I was unaware of at the time. And so I've asked a few of them. And they said, we knew you cared about us. That's what struck me. We knew you cared about us. Yes, we caused a great deal of mischief, but you weren't mad at us. You seemed to understand that's what kids do. But we knew you cared about us. And you know, it's not that easy to find people who really do. So we've kept contact with you 
And we realize that what you did, you did in the name of Jesus and the love of the church and the love of the faith. And you wanted to share that with us. And so I realized that, and this is maybe the divine sense of humor, the one who sowed was 26, the one who reaped was 76. So sometimes you might be the one who reaps what you sowed, but it happened years and years ago. And so have confidence that the power of the Holy Spirit will act when you're sincere and dedicated and you mean it. Have conviction that the Holy Spirit will act and you don't need to, you don't, he doesn't have to prove to you how he's acting. You'll believe me, he can't help revealing it over time. Can't help it, can't help it. We'll reveal it over time. As far as the Sacrament of Reconciliation, by the way, I know is available. So I'll, I'll tell you a brief story about the Sacrament of Reconciliation. I was giving a retreat and uh, it was, uh, I was asked to be one of the speakers at a, a large retreat. I think there were three or 400 people there. And uh, I had this, they asked me to talk on the Eucharist. And I had prepared what I considered the greatest talk on the Eucharist ever since John's Gospel. Uh, I was quite pleased with my talk on the Eucharist. So they're all sitting there and I'm heading down the aisle and there's 300, and just before I go down the aisle, the, the director of, you know, of the retreat uh, taps me on the shoulder and he says, give me, give me a for a second. He said, uh, he said, we have, I'm all worried. I said, what's the matter? And he said, we have 300 people here. I have 12 priests, they all showed up. I'm afraid people aren't gonna con confession when this ends afterwards. Would, would you urge people to go to the Sacrament of Reconciliation? And I'm thinking, I'm in the middle of paragraph four of my, the brilliant talk I'm gonna give, and now he's telling me to create another talk on the way down the aisle. So I said, uh, sure, 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 I'll say something. So I head down the aisle and I get up and I said to myself, let me get this over as quickly as possible. So I said, look, I've just been encouraged, I want, I'm supposed to encourage all of you to go to the Sacrament of Reconciliation. I just wanna let you know something. I'm a garbage collector. If you wanna come in and throw the garbage away, please feel free, right? I was probably expressing my sarcasm and my anger at being interrupted. So, after the talk on the Eucharist, uh, I went into the confessional. And about an hour later I came out when it started and the director comes up and he says, oh my God, I can't thank you enough. I can't thank you enough. He said, it seems like everybody went to confession. And he said, you know what they kept saying? To want, are you a priest who collects garbage? <laughs> I said, what about the Eucharist? And he said, you gave a talk on the Eucharist? <laughs> so five years later, I was in my own parish hearing confessions and a woman came in, she said, do you still collect garbage? <laughs> so that's what I mean. One sows and another reaps. So you just, the Lord has his own plan and his own design. He's the artist. You know, sometimes, you wouldn't walk into the Sistine Chapel with Michelangelo there and say, you want me to tell you how you can paint better over here? <laughs> you might, if he said, could you hand me the green ones, you might hand them the green paint, but you wouldn't tell him how to paint it. Um, and sometimes we don't realize what a privilege, the creativity of the artistry of God. You know, the first thing that we're told about God is that God is an artist. We think the first thing we're told is that uh, God is a, is a um, lawyer or a judge. But the first thing we're told is in the beginning, God created. That's what artists do. God created. So anytime you try to create something, you're participating in the creative genius of God who wanted to create something beautiful. Wanted to create something beautiful. And when it, when it broke, he was determined to repair it. I, they say there's a mark, and I think I've seen it in um, on the sculptor uh, the, of the Michelangelo's Pieta, where somebody took a hammer and smashed off the thumb. And I think, I think there's a, uh, they had like a hundred artists come in and pick up every single tiny, tiny piece that they could find and put it back. And today it just looks, looks as good as new. It's amazing to see it. Um, the artist, the creative artist, anything that is artistic. And life is an art form. Life is an art form. And you're invited to be disciples of the Lord. 
disciples of the Lord, not just as a, as a legal person, but uh, as an artist. You know, if Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John uh, are about one thing, basically, you can almost say they're about one word. Now, obviously, the word is Jesus, but I'm going to put that off to the side. That's obvious. Then I would say it's this word that's not in there, and it's about identity. Identity. Every single thing in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John concerns the identity of Jesus, who Jesus is. In the Synoptic Gospels, of course, in the, the famous Luke's birth scene, where Jesus is the, the infant, the infant, uh, and they come and proclaim him, they honor him as the Messiah and the God. Then you go to John's gospel, it's done completely differently. It begins, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. But it's the identity of Jesus that's absolutely critical throughout all four gospels. And you know, when you have a scandal, I'll tell you what a scandal is. It's not so much a crime or a breaking of a law, though it's all of that. A scandal happens when you betray an identity. When you betray an identity, it's a tremendous impact on people because whether they think of it or not, they're relying on that identity to be faithful and true. They're relying on that identity. And Jesus doesn't so much verbally go out proclaiming himself, he reveals by what he does who he is. Cain and Galilee, right? He comes to the aid of the married couple and they're gathering there. And you know, I've noticed that, I found it interesting that the name of the bride and groom aren't mentioned. And I think that's partly because Jesus himself is the bridegroom. He's the bridegroom at that wedding. He's the one who came to propose a marriage to the human race that is celebrated in the Eucharist where Jesus says the, the words that are equivalent of a, of a marriage vow. This is my body which is given up for you. This is my body which is given up for you. I knew a tough decision that a young man had to make in a upcoming wedding I had. His bride-to-be, about seven months before the wedding, was told that she had a rare form of cancer and probably wouldn't make it for those seven months. Uh, now, there were several unusual things about this young lady. One of it is, was that she was a, um, uh, though she was about 22, she was in graduate school for science on a fellowship. And when she went to the university, I won't, I won't name which school it was, but it's a renowned one. She went to the university to say that, you know, she got this diagnosis and she probably won't be able to continue teaching. Um, they came back to her and said, you know, we're going to run a program, a special testing program, um, and we'd like you to volunteer to join it. And they said, you're the best candidate we could possibly have because you're in excellent condition, you're extremely intelligent, you understand science, and you would probably buy into it as well as participate in it. So she did. I asked her father at a future point, what the cost of that would have been, and he, they told him about $200,000. Um, anyway, um, he was faced with a decision because she said she wanted to, um, she didn't see how they could go on. And he responded and said, if I am proposing to you that on your, our wedding day I will say, for richer or for poor, in sickness and health, till death to his part. How can I prove to myself that I meant that unless we stay together until we're parted by death? So the six months, seven months passed. She was very frail looking. And then gradually she was told the testing indicated that she was improving and responding to these drugs they were giving her. And a year later, I presided at the wedding in Chicago. Um, she looked still pretty frail. 
But there she was coming down that aisle, and I said, wow, wow, this is what love means. Hmm. And there they were exchanging the vows, and you could imagine the emotional reaction of all their friends watching this, watching this take place. Um, recently, they sent me a, a card, and they included the picture of their two children in it. Um, and uh, they said, God provides, God provides. I said, well, you, <laughs> you had a lot of courage and faith yourself. Um, so the capacity to care, I think, is, is a critical one to let other people know that we care. Um, one of the hardest things to do, you know, we're so oriented toward outcomes and productivity um, and solutions. Um, recently, I went, to, uh, I went to see a priest who I had been involved in a situation. I was wondering how he was doing. So I went to uh, visit him and I said, he was telling me all about what was going on in the parish and things that were happening. And then I said, okay, now I do have one, one final question. How are you? And he just sat there in silence. And he said, do you have time? And I said, as much as you want. So an hour later, with tears in his eyes, he finished telling his story. And when I got up, uh, he hugged me and he said, I can't thank you enough. I've been waiting for somebody to ask me not what I'm doing, but how I'm doing. How I'm doing. How I'm doing. How are you? One time, I, uh, everybody needs to feel understood. This is the neglected question. How are you? Everybody needs to feel understood. One time, a secretary of mine, who was an excellent secretary, um, uh, she, I said to her, um, oh, by the way, I haven't asked you in a while, how, how are you doing? And I sat down, and she said, okay. And I said, no, no, I mean, how are you doing? Not just okay. And she said, she looked at me, and she said, wow. She said, you know, I, as you know, I love my husband. We've been married for 20 years. And the only time he ever says, how, how, are you, how are you is on his way to the refrigerator to get a beer. <laughs> He's never actually sat down and waited for the answer. I'm amazed that you're doing that. And I said, because we all need to feel understood, that's why. We're people, not just products, not just employees. We're people. And taking the time to understand that and realizing we need time to understand ourselves and our own reactions to things. We have to listen also to ourselves and that takes time. We need some time alone every day with the Lord. Invite him to come into our lives and show us the way. As all the priests know, so many people ask us to pray for them on the journey of life and they tell us a story. And a lot of times with the invention of the uh, cell phone, and now a lot of these stories are on the messages that I get in the course of a day. And so I try to remember specifically when I take time alone with the Lord to mention those people and what they've asked me to pray for. Because it's so easy to take it for granted. I don't ask him for this outcome or that, just this, they need help. Lord, and I want to intercede on their behalf. And sometimes we can get used even to something like saying Mass, if you say Mass once, twice, sometimes, I've, in my case, three times in a day. And I try to, re to, to turn that by remembering the people who've asked me to pray for them, and specifically remembering them at Mass, which is a great privilege for the priest to do. Yes, focusing on the positives, um, uh, sowing, being confident in the Lord. You know, hope is confidence in Jesus. It's confidence in, in the final outcome of things because they're in his hands. That's where our hope is founded. Founded on the, I remember a, a book, um, it was entitled, I had read stories by um, people who were in, um, had some form of faith and were in political prison situations. 
And um, one of them was, if you know the history of the Cultural Revolution in China, this woman was, uh, was a Chinese woman who had worked for an English firm, in, and so she was arrested as a spy. And she spent 10 years in, in prison, uh, solitary confinement. And she said she was in complete, utter despair. And one day she looked up and there was a window, the only the window that she couldn't look out of because it was too high. But she watched as a spider started to create a web. And she watched the spider and she said to herself, God sent that spider. God sent that spider to me to tell me if a spider can create something beautiful under these conditions, so can you. And she said, from that moment on, I decided that I would create the story of my experience, that if I ever got out, so I went through my entire life, I went through my entire life in my mind, recalling the various challenges that I had to face and trying to react to them the way that spider reacted to its little opportunity to create a web in that little corner of that prison way up there in that window. It's amazing how some people learn. And of course, the book she was writing, which was eventually written in Washington, D.C., in English, uh, that book was um, uh, My Life in Shanghai, I think it was called. Anyway, it was the story of her entire experience. And it was the outcome of watching the spider. This is what she had woven as a result of that. And it's a fascinating story. And she talks about her gratitude to God for sending the spider her way. That's finding the positives, I'll tell you. It's a whole other level. And if you've ever read the story about the, um, the, the uh, Russian who was imprisoned, he was a Jewish fellow imprisoned uh, in, for 12 years in uh, Russia before the, he was finally released in a trade with the West. And, um, uh, and he writes in there how they wouldn't let him have any books. So he, and they also put him in prison cells with the most difficult people in the prison because they were trying to drive him crazy. So they put him, but they didn't know, he said, that I try to relate to anybody I have to deal with. So instead of being in this prison and hating these people who he put in there, who they put in there so they would drive him crazy, he related to them and tried to understand them. And eventually he made connections with them in whatever field they were interested in, whatever they had done, he made connections with their life. And so this frustrated the authorities so much they finally decided we gotta give, leave this guy out on his own. And so he asked for books to read and they said, absolutely not. So he said, what about, would they let him read a book in Hebrew? Well, he, he remembered they were puzzled by this because they figured, well, he's not gonna read something that's about the overthrowing of our government, probably. So he, they gave him, he said, all I want is the book of Psalms, book of Psalms. And it's a tremendous, I would recommend priests to read it if you're saying the, the liturgy of the hours saying the Psalms. It's a tremendous testimony to how he identified with the suffering in the Psalms. He said, over these 12 years that I was there, these Psalms fed me day in and day out. I went right through every day reading a Psalm, day after day for the 12 years. And he said, when he was brought out as an exchange, I think they were flying him to Berlin to exchange him for somebody else, he was almost out of the prison when he realized he had forgotten his book of Psalms. And they said, you forgot what? And he said, I forgot my book of Psalms, I have to go back and get it. They said, you're going back into the prison it took you 12 years to try and get out of? He said, I can't live without my Psalms. So they said, it's only a little red book. We don't know what's in it anyway, it's all in Hebrew. So he went and he got his book and he carried it on the plane and he carried it all the way. And uh, it's a tremendous story about how he used the Psalms to pray and he felt the presence of God in those Psalms and in those prayers. Uh, he felt the, the presence very powerfully. Uh, and so when we say 
when we say the Psalms, uh, we're, we're joining with Jesus in his prayer and we're praying together with the entire community. So if you have time in your life to find a few moments to say a Psalm or two, you could identify, uh, you could identify with that. The power of the Psalms, in this case, to sustain him and for the other woman, it was a case of the example the example of that spider inspiring her, create something beautiful no matter where you are. And you'll always have opportunities. You'll always have opportunities. We get so much news these days that we can be overwhelmed by it all. I read an interesting book one time. It was talking about uh, um, Jesus and the issue of power. And it said that, you know, a little bit connected with what I said in the beginning, that the human, in the human race, there are people constantly seeking power over others. Um, you can turn on any channel you want, you'll find that story on there. People seeking power over others. All over the world, there are people trying to get power over others. And they said, Jesus didn't want power over, he wanted power with. He wanted to influence others for good. He wanted the power of his compassion to touch their lives. And that's why this author says, and it was this interesting, a secular author, he says, the, law, the, the story of Jesus continues to endure because in the end we find out that all power over other brings is anger and violence. Anger and violence. And we see it to this very day, stories all over the world of anger and violence, anger and violence. When will we ever give it up? And Jesus was very powerful, all right. He was powerful and he felt the power go out from him, but it was not, he didn't want power over others. The devil offered him the whole world. He said, here, every kingdom can be yours. Not interested, not interested. I don't want power over, I want power with, which is love. And you know, if you love somebody, how they can be an inspiration for you to act better than you ever acted before. That's what real love does. It, it, it inspires you to be a better person by the way you behave. Another issue is in our society, we love the word uh, freedom and liberty. Those are our, kind of our favorite words. And um, Viktor Frankl, who is the author of the book, uh, Man's Search for Meaning, uh, a psychiatrist, Jewish psychiatrist who was a victim of, I think it was Auschwitz was the one he was in. And he tried to help people while he was there find meaning and, and what they were going through. And he realized he was finding meaning and helping others find meaning. And that's why he writes the book, The Search for Meaning. We're all looking for meaning. What is the meaning? What is it that means something to us in our life that will enable us to have clarity and determination and fortitude, aiming for something that really matters. And they asked him one time about, um, I don't know if he was visiting the United States or and they were showing him the Statue of Liberty and saying how much it means. And he said, I just wish that if there was a Statue of Liberty, there would also always be a Statue of Responsibility. A Statue of Responsibility because he said, Liberty all to itself is what ended me up in the prison. We need not just freedom, but responsibility in the use of that freedom. That's the challenge, responsibility. I remember um, we took this course, one of the courses I took was with a, a, a Jesuit, now a deceased who was a psychiatrist, and he, he was giving examples of counseling cases. And he said four words, I'll never forget. And it was no challenge, no growth. That is so true. And he was saying, if you're listening to somebody and they're telling you the story, at some point, you have to give them some form of challenge. Some form of challenge. I remember, for example, um, when this, uh, another situation I was in where somebody was a sister was telling me about her assignment and everything had gone wrong in it. And I said, are there any positives? She said, no. I said, do you attend mass every day? 
She looked at me and she said, of course I do. I said, that's a positive. Wow, she said, that's a good point. I take that for granted, don't I? What else do you take for granted? What else do you take for granted? So appreciating the positives that you have. You get seriously ill and you realize that nothing seems to matter except your health, right? All of a sudden, that's the positive you took for granted all those years. So being appreciative, and we're the most blessed. I know when I talk to uh, teenagers, sometimes at confirmations, I, I kind of say that you're the, <clears throat> you're, you're the richest young people that ever existed in the history of the world. Because there's no generation anywhere in the world that has the opportunities that you have in the United States of America. And there's no, there's no place else in the world that had all the creativity and inventions that we've had. I remember telling this story at one of the <coughs> confirmations that if Jesus walked down the aisle today, today, and he turned around and he said, what's new? I was speaking to teenagers. I said, and he said, what's new? You'd all pull out your cell phone and show it to him. You'd say to him, 78 in Jerusalem, 74 at the Sea of Galilee. And then you'd tell him about airplanes. Did you ever see an airplane? Do you know we landed on the moon? Do you have any idea where the moon is? We would be bragging about all this. I said, you'd be bragging about all these incredible things. You'd, be, you'd say, you, walk, you rode on a donkey? Wait till you see our most advanced cars and the planes we have. It's incredible compared to what you had. And I said, Jesus might reply by saying, well, I just came up the Garden State Parkway and I wish I had been on a donkey. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but then I said, Jesus might say, well, you know, I'm not surprised by that. And I'll tell you why I'm not surprised. I lived at the time of Herod, who was a brilliant engineer. I lived at the time of Herod and Caesar. And Caesar and the whole Roman Empire were master organizers and builders. In fact, they were so good at it that your government to this day borrows a word that they used, Senatus, Senate. That's a word they use for their government. And we borrowed it. And Jesus would say, so I knew the human capacity of the mind to think. What concerned me was this. Is there still anger in the world? Is there still violence between people? And I said to the young people, at that point, all of you would turn off your cell phones, put them in your pocket, go and sit down and hang your heads. And then one of you might say, no, Jesus, it's, only, it's much worse than when you were alive. Much worse. And Jesus would say, but what about the gift? What about that gift of the Holy Spirit that was to guide you on the journey? Didn't you use the gift? You know, when you travel, you ask people who've traveled to a place they've never gone before, especially if it's somewhat exotic uh, and quasi-dangerous or at least far removed from them, and you say, how was the trip? They'll often you say the following thing. We had a fabulous guide. It was a, we had a great guide. It was a wonderful trip. We had a great guide. Well, you know what? None of us have been on this journey before, have we? If you have, please keep it to yourself. <laughs> Tell me later. None of us. Why is it we don't want a guide? Have we been here before? Uh, I remember uh, the first time I went to uh, Israel, uh, we, we had a guide that took us. It wasn't, it was actually not a religious trip. It was an educational study trip I was on. And they took us to some of the uh, battle zones connected with the, the war that went on there in the... Um, and I remember we went to the Golan Heights and they were showing us, I think that was the spot where the biggest, uh, the biggest uh, tank battle in history had occurred. And, and so somebody said, could we get out and look around? And the guide said, you can, but within 10 feet you might be blown up by a mine we haven't found yet. So everybody decided to stay on the bus. <laughs> and follow the path. And I said to myself, see, this is, this, is what it, this is what a guide is. 
You know, the guide wants you to be successful and he recommends, but don't try this, it doesn't work in the long run. It's a dangerous place to go. And we listen because we trust the guide. Well, this is the one journey of life that we're on. Fortunately for all of us, we're here today because we trust the guide. There's a prayer I say at the end of every day, and if you know it, you might want to say it with me. Remember, O oh most gracious Virgin Mary, never was it known that anyone who fled to thy protection, implored thy help, or sought thy intercession was left and aided. Inspired by this confidence, I fly into you, a virgin of virgins, my mother. To you do I come, before you I stand, sinful and sorrowful. O oh, mother of the word incarnate, despise not my petition, but in thy mercy hear and answer me, amen. I entrust you all to the mother of love. God bless you.